In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we do confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue now in your bulletins with our intro for today from, from Luke 24 and Psalm 8. And we proclaim our intro responsibly. He is risen, hallelujah. Why do you sleep living among the dead? Hallelujah. Remember how he spoke to you. Hallelujah. The Son of Man must be crucified, and the third day rise again. Hallelujah. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him have dominion over the works of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet. O Lord, our Lord. How excellent is your glory in all the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning. Let us pray 
let us pray. O God, for our redemption you gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection defended us from the power of the enemy. Grant that all our sin may be drowned through daily repentance, and that day by day we may arise to live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. as we hear from God's Word. The Old Testament reading for the resurrection of our Lord is from the 19th chapter of the book of Job. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual is from Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Our epistle reading is from the fifth chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. <laughs> Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, 
and there they will see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to we continue now with sharing our Christian faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed as found on page 158. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under conscious Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one the holy Christian apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue now with singing together hymn number 464, The Strive is O'er, The Battle Done, number 464.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. It is my privilege on this day of resurrection to bring you tidings of grace and peace from God our Father and the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 28. Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. The chief priests confront us with the one teaching that truly defines a Christian. What do you believe? about the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. What one believes about the events of the first Easter is the test of faith. Paul seems to sum it all up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Good Friday alone does not save. The debt for sin was paid, but there was no victory. What does the resurrection show? It shows that God the Father accepted the life of Jesus for our sins. Without the resurrection, Jesus was swallowed up by death, just like all the rest of humanity from the beginning of time. Without the resurrection, believers who have already died have perished eternally, and so will we. Without the resurrection, this world and our Christian life are without any meaning. Once you snip off eternity, what point is there to this world at all? What difference does it make whether you are saved or just plain evil if there is no moral reckoning beyond this life? If this world is all there is, then we better say what the other children of this world say. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? The resurrection is what gives all of life its meaning. Without it, life is empty, hopeless, and pointless. And you cannot have it both ways. Either Jesus rose from the dead, or he did not. The various attempts to ride the fence that Jesus rose in spirit rather than body, and the variations on that theme, they're all quite illogical and extremely unsatisfactory. Nothing in this world's past or present is of more importance, more interest, or more controversy than the Easter event. Critics of Christianity have repeatedly attempted to discredit the resurrection. They have done so to protect their position, to deal with their fear of God, with their fear of moral reckoning, and also to undermine the confidence of believers. The lie of the chief priests in our text, which they told to protect their position, is only the first of many to cast doubt on the resurrection at the first Easter. It is, the, it is called the stolen body theory. The disciples removed Jesus' body so that they could hatch the myth of a risen Christ. Other theories range from the crude to the elaborate. They include theories about an angry gardener who wanted to keep people out of the garden and move the body to an unmarked grave. Or that they went to the wrong tomb. Or the idea that Jesus did not really die on the cross. And that the whole thing was an hallucination. 
But probably my favorite is that Jesus had an identical twin brother who remained in seclusion until Jesus' death on the cross. Then he emerged, giving the impression of resurrection. The danger of a lie is not that it will destroy the truth. It cannot. But, the, the, but that the lie makes us uncertain and undermines our belief in the truth. A lie told a million times will be believed as if it were the truth. But you know, all the various lies about the resurrection have one important point in common. They all sat down and accept the fact that the tomb was empty. Strange, huh? Would it not have been a much more effective attack against Christianity to prove that Jesus' body was never missing, but that it lay in Joseph's tomb all the while? Astonishingly, this argument has not been used. And for good reason. There is a load of compelling evidence outside of the gospel accounts, outside of the Bible, in other historical records, that Jesus' tomb was indeed empty on Easter morning. Now, for the sake of argument, let's grant the argument of his enemies for a moment. If Christ did not rise, and we suppose the disciples stole the body, where is the burial? And you have another problem when you deny the resurrection. Remember what the disciples did and what they were like on Good Friday? I mean, they were really courageous men, right? Ha! Hardly. They were more like grade A cowards. They ran. They hid. If Christ did not rise, and the disciples all got together and decided to lie about it, can you tell me what it was that changed those 11 men into courageous witnesses of the resurrected Christ? Let me ask you, would you be willing to die for something that you know is a lie. Because history suggests that all the disciples except one were martyred. Young John, but he was unsuccessfully poisoned. So they tried to kill him. They were executed for what they believed and preached about Christ. Now, are you following the argument here? Something had to change these people. Now, we know, of course, that the resurrection is the truth, but it would have been an awfully obvious lie. There's no way these guys would have suffered crucifixion, beheading, having their skin torn off their body, all these things for something that they knew was a lie. They wouldn't do it. If Jesus did not rise, and the disciples stole his body and hid it someplace, then they had an awful lot of nerve to die for a lie that size. Instead, Scripture says, take God's word for it. And the reality is so obvious. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. That's more like Thank you. And that fact transformed the lives of those men completely. The reality of the resurrection. And the pouring out of the Holy Spirit has the power to transform us the same way. The 
circumstantial evidence for the empty tomb is overpowering. It deals with the question, where did Christianity first begin? Now to this, the answer must be only in one spot on earth. Christianity started in the city of Jerusalem. That is a completely non-contradicted fact. But you know, that is the very place that it, that is the very last place in the world that it could have started if Jesus' tomb still remained occupied, right? Since anyone producing his body would have snuffed out the flame of an infant Christianity preaching his resurrection. What happened in Jerusalem seven weeks after the first Easter, on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came on the apostles and they started preaching Jesus all over the place, that could have only taken place if Jesus' body were somehow missing from Joseph's tomb. For otherwise, the temple establishment, in its confrontation with the apostles, would simply have ended the, ended the movement by making a brief trip over to the sepulcher of Joseph of Arimathea and unveiling Exhibit A. But they did not do this because they knew the tomb was empty. Their official explanation for it, that the disciples had stolen the body, was not just a lie, but it was also an admission that the tomb was indeed vacant. The body of Christ is not there because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Okay, you were more prepared that time. Good. <laughs> the chief priests spell a lie. But the truth remains victorious. Jesus Christ is alive. We have a living Lord. God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And God is not dead, but he is alive. And because Christ lives, there is a tomorrow. Because he lives, we have a future. And a hope. Not only that there is meaning now to all of our days. We can face each day with the reality that we are not alone. All of our days are changed. All of our feelings rest on the foundation of joy in the forgiveness of sins. Won for us by Jesus dying on the cross and proven effective by his rising from the grave. All our behavior is motivated because he was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, we live in the reality of Easter as God's people. Remember, St. Paul says that in baptism, you are baptized into Christ, into his death, and into his resurrection. What happens to Christ in body and soul will happen to you in body and soul because you are connected to him. He died, you will die, but he rose victorious with a glorified body that will never die again. And because he rose, that means that you will too. Guaranteed. And so we worship him. We are not afraid to say that we believe in the living Lord. We believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We pray in the Apostles' Creed every day in our daily prayers. If you're actually following what Luther says to do in small catechism. We stand on the faith that's been given to us, handed down by generations in the church for 2,000 years. 
And by that faith, we are saved. Jesus, the long-awaited Christ, truly is the Son of God. And He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now on page 159 with singing together our offertory, What Shall I Render to the Lord? Please rise. Grant them renewed health, a foretaste 
of their eternal healing in Him. Lord, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us joy in Your Son's great victory feast as He shares it with us from this altar. In the eating of His true body and the drinking of His precious blood and faith, overcome our sin by His forgiveness and swallow up our death in His life that we may be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Lord, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort those who mourn with the truth of Christ's empty tomb, especially the family and friends of Pastor Joseph Fabre, that in the midst of their grief, they may abide in the hope of His resurrection. Uphold them in faith as they wait the day when you will wipe every tear from all faces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We join today in singing eternal hallelujahs with innumerable angels in festal gathering, with the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And we bring these petitions before you, dear Father, trusting in your mercy through faith in Christ Jesus. We continue now on page 160 with the service of the Sabbath. The Lord be with you. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, 
to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and His kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We continue now on page 164 with singing together our post communion canticle, Thank the Lord. Please rise. <laughs>
Christ is risen. He is risen.